Hello, everybody. This is uh, Steve Spence, the president of the Structural Engineers Association of San Diego, welcoming you to our uh, November meeting. Uh, thank you all for uh, attending. Um, before I get into our chapter announcements, um, I just wanted to thank everybody for their response to my um, my president's message this month. Uh, I know I have a lot of people have uh, um, really enjoyed it, and I haven't had any time to write back to them and thank them. So I just want to thank everybody for for giving me the thumbs up. Don't expect uh, that type of writing out of me every month. Uh, we'll see if if I can do even one more, even close to that, the rest of the time I'm on pre uh, as president. But uh, thank you very much for that. Anyway, on to chapter announcements. Um, so next month, uh, on December 15th, we have our joint meeting with ASCE, and we're presenting on the SoFi Stadium up in uh, Los Angeles, the new home of the uh, LA Rams and the Boo LA Chargers. Um, um, we, we have uh, presenters on both the civil um, and the structural side. So you can see all the presenters there. We have uh, Daring Volkman Viola, uh, the vice president of David Evans Associates, he's a civil engineer. We have Rafael Savelli, uh, who's the director of seismic design, Walter P. Moore, Walter Eggers from Kiwit, he's the bridge engineer, Jose Cruz, also from David Evans, and Patrick Labib, the project manager from Turner Construction Company. So we've got quite a crew of people presenting on a really cool project, and hopefully someday it'll actually open and people can enjoy it. Um, we have our SEAC convention, and it's all virtual format um, coming uh, December 2nd through the 4th. I believe registration is open for that. Um, they have basically individual and group rates available. I hope to see all of you joining uh, um, joining us at the 2020 SEAC convention. Uh, lastly, we have on, on January 19th meeting, um, uh, Jeremy Callister is going to be uh, presenting on uh, the SEAC Blue Book. Uh, those who are not aware, they've been a pretty major update to the SEAC Blue Book, and, and so uh, Jeremy's going to be going all um, over that um, at our January meeting. And with that, I will uh, pass it on to uh, Bo Jaquist to uh, introduce our speaker. Although before before Bo starts introducing our speaker, I would like to explain that the the um, questions and answers during this um, presentation are going to be a little bit different than in weeks past. For some reason, the chat function is disabled on all of our screens, um, at least my screen, so I can't moderate the questions. So what we're going to ask is on the questions that you virtually raise your hand and we will, and then you will unmute yourself when we call on you at the end of the presentation. Thank you. So with uh, Bo Jacobs, please take it away. Right, thanks, Steve. So uh, we're excited to have Bo Dalswell with us today. Um, Bo started in the steel industry in 1985 as a detailer. Since then, he earned his bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees from Auburn University and the University of Alabama at Birmingham. As a professional engineer, his design practice focuses on steel structures. Currently, he's principal of both SDS Consulting and ARC International, uh, which specializes in research and consulting. Bo is also an adjunct professor at University of Alabama, Birmingham, where his research and teaching is concentrated on steel connection design. Additionally, he provides consulting services for the AISC Steel Solutions Center. Dr. Dalswell is the author of AISC Design Guide 33, Curved Member Design, and he regularly publishes technical articles on steel design. He's a member of several AISC committees, including the Committee on Specifications, the Committee on Manuals, the Committee on Research, and the Task Group on Industrial Buildings and Non-Building Structures. He is a member of the Structural Stability Research Council, where his activities are primarily related to connection element and beam stability. So with that, uh, thank you again, Dr. Doswell, for being with us today and uh, take it away. Bo, if you could share your screen now. Okay, thanks Bo. 
I assume you can see my screen now. Yes, looks good. All right, so the 2020 Higgins lecture is going to be all about gusset plates. Um, but I'm not going to kind of go through and, and give you a step by step lecture on how to design gusset plates. Uh, hopefully what I'm going to do here is, a, is more valuable because what we're going to do is uh, uh, Kind of the second part of the title describes actually what we're going to do, the evolution of simplified design models. So we're going to kind of go back and see how the information in the AISC manual and the specifications was developed. And that's not so much just to kind of bore you with a history lesson. It's uh, mainly to uh, give you this background information so that you can kind of use the same ideas, the same philosophy on developing these design models for other things that you run into more complicated connections like uh, even for something like a, a skewed moment connection or anything like that that you find that's not necessarily uh, spelled out step by step in the AISC manual or some other publication. So the first thing I want to do is thank the jury for the uh, 2020 Higgins award and one thing that you'll note by looking at the the people on the screen is that even though the jury changes from year to year they they kind of keep the same mix of people on the jury in other words you'll have uh, kind of all the way from professors you know which i consider kind of theoretical end of things and then you have the design engineers and all the way over to the opposite end of the spectrum from the professors is, are the uh, engineers that work with the uh, fabricators and erectors on a day-to-day -day basis. So you get a wider, wide range of, of uh, people on the jury and uh, kind of makes it an interesting award. You know, it's a technical award, but, but then again, it's got that practical aspect to it. So it's, it's a really interesting award to look back, uh, which I did after uh, I found out that I've won it, I look back at the other uh, people that have won it and uh, we'll see how that kind of plays in uh, to this lecture. So the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, the definition of gusset plates. And I kind of just made this up. It may not be the same as what you see if you look it up in uh, somewhere else, but uh, uh, a gusset plate can be defined as an element that connects actually loaded members to adjacent framing members. And that doesn't really uh, mean too much to you probably if you if you didn't know what a gusset plate was before this slide, you probably can't picture what it is after this. But uh, let's take a look at some pictures and maybe that'll clear things up. The uh, gusset plates uh, typically are thought of in vertical bracing systems and uh, it connects the vertical brace to the adjacent framing members. So in this case, the job of the gusset plate is to take load and distribute that load from the brace or the diagonal member into the Uh, two gusset plates on the top and bottom flange of this beam are known as corner gusset plates. And that's primarily what we'll talk about today are these corner gusset plates. Uh, but there are, as you know, different uh, shapes of gusset plates uh, that connect only to one member instead of at a corner where you have a beam connecting to a column like this. You also have gusset plates and trusses. Uh, this is a double plane gusset plate because you have two almost identical gusset plates side by side for each connection. And of course, the job of the gusset plate and this connection is to transfer loads from the web members of this truss into the cords. And finally, we have horizontal bracing gusset plates. And these are, of course, where you have braces in the horizontal plane instead of the vertical plane. And you can see in this case, the single angle horizontal brace is connected to the gusset plate and the job of the gusset plate is to transfer that load into the adjacent beams. The, uh, in this case, they're connected to the beam web, but uh, in some cases it can be connected to the beam flanges or uh, 
if you have varying depth of beams, like in this case, it can be connected to one web and say the bottom flange of the other beam. Um, if you look at the corner of this gusset plate, this is what's known as a wraparound gusset plate. And uh, you see that it's cut out around the uh, column because those two beams meet at a column. So that large cutout at the uh, uh, to clear that column and also that beam to column flange connection uh, creates a, a, a situation that we'll talk about for wraparound gusset plates at the end of the presentation. Now let's talk about the design zones for these gusset plates. And uh, actually, I kind of uh, made up this terminology just for this presentation because uh, even though we've been designing gusset plates using what I'm calling these design zones, ever since I got into this industry in the mid 80s, uh, they haven't really, nobody has actually kind of explained this uh, in the way that I'm going to do over the next few slides, kind of where we break down uh, the areas of this gusset plate into separate zones that are treated independently. Um, but uh, like I say, even though we've been doing it this way, it's never it's never kind of been broken down and explained this way. I mean, if you look into some of the older books like the Engineering for Steel Construction uh, that AISC published um, back then, you will just see, OK, here are the steps to design a gusset plate. Uh, one is to look at the uh, edge interfaces, one is to look at the Whitmore zones, uh, and so on. So uh, the two things that we'll look at are the Whitmore zone and the edge interfaces. Uh, the Whitmore zone is the area between the diagonal member and the adjacent framing members, and we'll see why we call that the Whitmore zone later in the presentation. But you can see just kind of out of uh, engineering judgment that the the uh, area right beyond the diagonal uh, should be an area that we check because that's going to be kind of an area where we understand that there's a high stress concentration. So the Whitmore zone and the edge interfaces, in this case, because this is a corner gusset plate, we have two edge interfaces, one at the gusset to column connection and one at the gusset to beam connection. Now, these are pretty straightforward to design the edge interfaces. There's really not too much buckling or anything like that that we need to worry about. So um, you can take a look at Design Guide 29 from AISC and get information on how to design these. Uh, we're we're going to look more at the Whitmore zone because it's not quite as straightforward uh, for this presentation. Now, one thing I will mention, though, is that before we move on, these uh, breaking this down into three separate regions is not so much different, even though it's, even though we're breaking down one plate into three different design zones, it's not much different from what we do in any other structure. For example, if you have uh, a wood, uh, concrete, or steel structure, you uh, don't go into the AISC manual or the uh, ACI manuals and uh, pull out an equation for a, uh, a certain sized commercial warehouse type building. So you, you, uh, you, you, what you do, of course, is you build the model and once you apply the loads, you solve for the loading on the members. And then at that point, you pull everything out. You kind of pull it out just like we did for these gusset plates and design as separate beams, columns, and bracing members. So um, even though it's kind of different in that it's one individual plate that we're talking about separating, it's not that much different from what we're used to doing in practice. And what we're going to do over this uh, uh, entire presentation, of course, we've already said we're going to talk about Whitmore zone and the wraparound gusset plates. But before we can do that, we need to cover some basic information on design models. So that's what we'll cover first. OK, the design model section is going to be more of a, uh, a general discussion on design models for connections. And it's not really 
going to be so much specific to gusset plates. So if we take a look at that extremely simple connection on the left hand side, we'll just say we have a uh, web horizontal uh, heavy truss cord, wide flange truss cord, and um, maybe it's in like the uh, the figure that uh, in in the arena that was discussed uh, prior to this uh, presentation that you'll be learning about in the future uh, future meetings. But uh, that would probably be something like this, where you're trying to hang a catwalk off of a long span truss cord, and uh, the tension member that uh, hanger angle has to be connected to the cord but if you connect directly in the middle of that cord it's going to try to bend that web so typically you'll put a plate on there to distribute the loads out to the stiffest parts of that cord which are the flanges and what you end up with there have actually been tests and finite element models uh, uh, research on this and what you'll find is that only a small portion somewhere between two, three, maybe all the way up to 6% of that hanger load goes into the web and the rest goes into the two flange connections because they're stiffer. Okay, so uh, what we can do is just neglect that small percentage that goes into the web and uh, call this a beam element that's loaded at the center by that hanger load. And all we're losing is three to six percent on this connection, according to the tests and finite element models. Um, now, if you want to be exact, what you can do is go in and and uh, build your own inelastic. Usually, elastic finite element models aren't going to be great connections because they yield very early on. So you can build an inelastic finite element model and even make kind of a master's thesis out of it and spend months on this problem and find exactly where the stresses are going. But by the time you get to the end, you've only saved yourself about three to six percent. And uh, you've also kind of blown the schedule if you spend uh, that much time on every simple connection on this project. So uh, we need to, as a design office, uh, design engineers, we need to come up with a simple uh, 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 ways to uh, calculate the strength of these elements. And the way we're going to do that for this one is, is treat it as a simply supported beam. And uh, in that case, we've already done the hard work. We figured out what the design model is. And from there, we know how to calculate the moment. It's just PL over four based on a, a simply supported beam with a point load at the mid span. And we know how to calculate the plastic modulus and the section modulus and the shear area and all of those good things. So we're kind of home free on that one once we establish that design model. On the right hand side, we have a moment connection. And uh, being that I'm kind of uh, uh, in the, uh, uh, on the east part of the country, I really do not deal with seismic too much. So let's just say this is a non-seismic connection and therefore we're not gonna worry about uh, putting any moment through that web connection. We're just going to design the web connection for the shear load in the beam and the flange connections for the moment. And in that case, we can kind of create this simplified design model by breaking that moment down into a couple at the top and bottom flanges of the beam. And if your connection I've shown is not reversible, you have a tension member at the top. So that little plate tension member can be treated as a uh, the same way you would by going into the AIC specification as uh, as you would with a uh, a 20 foot long double angle brace member. So you're going to calculate the yield strength and the rupture strength at the net section if you have holes in that uh, plate, as well as the uh, weld and the bolt uh, if you have that connecting the to the uh, flange of the beam. OK, so it's as simple as that for that top connection, but the bottom looks like you're going to have to be uh, design that one as a compression member or a column because it has a compression load in it. OK, so we're designing all of these connection elements based on beams, uh, tension members and compression members. And we're using the uh, specification requirements in chapters D, E, F, G and H. But the question comes up is all of these requirements 
in the AISC specification were developed for uh, not for connection elements, but rather for full size uh, framing members. In other words, uh, W1490 columns and uh, W16 beams and, and pipes and HSS shapes and things like that. So can we use these equations for connection elements? And to answer that question, we need to ask another question. And that is, what are the primary differences? What we'll do is we'll talk about two of those primary differences today, the stress distribution and the geometric imperfections. And the reason we'll talk about those two is because they affect the stability of these elements. Let's talk about the stress distributions first. We'll spend a couple of slides on this. And I think everybody is familiar with uh, what happens if you either put a hole or a well of attachment to a member, whether it's in tension compression or uh, flexure, and you get peak stresses. So I have the simplest case shown on the screen where you have a tension member with the hole in it. And in this case, we have equations that we can look up if we want to know what that peak stress is. But uh, really, there are not many equations out there for most uh, of the uh, uh, connection uh, configurations, which are significantly more complicated than this. Uh, uh, and and that, that, that's the bad news. But the good news is that we're really, unless situation, you really do not need to know what that peak stress is because once you keep adding load to these members, that peak stress will kind of get into the yield of the uh, uh, of the uh, plate. And once it starts to yield, those stresses would redistribute and eventually it will reach the uh, full rupture strength, which is based on a uh, rectangular stress pattern rather than that kind of that curved peak pattern. OK, but the, the places where this peak stress will need to be known are things like uh, if you have uh, uh, a buckling problem, for example, which is this is not the case because it's in tension. But if you have compression stresses causing buckling, that peak stress can affect the buckling strength. Uh, and then what the things we want to talk about are the fatigue strength. Uh, those peak stresses affect the fatigue strength as well as the brittle rupture strength. For example, if you have a really low temperature structure that's subjected to the low temperature, like a bridge or something like that, that's the, where you're not within a heated uh, 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 building, that uh, uh, you can get these uh, brittle ruptures due to these peak stresses. OK, another thing on the, the uh, stresses are the beam equations. And uh, if you remember back from uh, probably sophomore level strengths of materials course, uh, when you derived the beam equation, MC over I, there were a lot of assumptions that went along with that equation before it could be derived to kind of simplify the equation. And one of those assumptions was, uh, for example, plane sections remain plane and uh, those do not necessarily hold true for the geometries for connections. So um, what we end up with are these peak stresses and the plot that I have shown on the screen where it plots the uh, flexural stress along the horizontal axis of the beam depth, which is shown on the vertical. Uh, and it plots that for an L over D of two, which is the length to depth ratio. So that might be even uh, two and less might describe what you would have for connection elements like the one that we did. We showed you for the uh, uh, hanger connection on the truss. So as it turns out, you, instead of MC over I, which is described by the dashed line, of course, it looks just like we thought it would zero at mid depth, maximum at the top and bottom of the beam, and it's defined by a straight line. Uh, it turns out that does not hold for low length depth ratios, which are given by the the uh, uh, curved line, which came from finite element models. And in this case, with an L over D of two, the stress at the top and bottom of this beam is 45% higher than predicted with MC over I. 
Now, once again, luckily for us, we really don't have to worry about that if we're going to have something that's compact enough where we have yielding to allow the stresses to redistribute and eventually we'll get to the plastic strength. But before we get there, we have to avoid rupture as well as buckling. Okay, I think we've got rupture under control on this. We have one of those special conditions that we talked about. So buckling is really the concern for these peak stresses. Another thing that affects the buckling strength of these connections are the geometric imperfections. For members, we can take a look in the code of standard practice, and we know from that that we have very well defined geometric imperfections for column members, where we have an out of straightness specified at L over a thousand and a sway imperfection or an out of plumb tolerance of L over 500 for those members. But when it comes to plates, the only document that I'm aware of that describes the out of flatness of plate elements is uh, ASTM A6. And if you take a look in that document and kind of look at the requirements for the out of flatness uh, and kind of combine those all into one, you'll see that the out of flatness allowables are greater than the member out of straightness allowables for say wide flange shapes or HSS members. Okay, the one thing to remember about this though is not only do we start off with a larger ratio, but uh, the A6 is applicable only to mill tolerances. So once they get out of the mill and get into the fabrication shop, you're going to have the fabricator punching and shearing and and flame cutting and welding and potentially even galvanizing the member and eventually it's going to get put on the truck and kind of banged around a little bit and and if it survives all of that and finally does get up in the air the uh, erector may find that there's a quarter inch gap between whatever they're bolting to in this plate and of course uh they may go all the way back down and get the shims that were intended for that connection, or they may just stick a bolt in there and close the gap by tightening the bolts. So you're going to get a lot of uh, potentially a lot of warpage due to that in the field. So that ASTM A6 may be good guidance for these plates somewhere along the way after they get out of the mill, uh, but uh, they don't necessarily describe what is actually in the structure once it gets erected. And the problem is, is that there are no documents available that I'm aware of that describe what the tolerances are for plates in the erected state. Um, there has been some research, the only, I, I will mention this, that uh, the research here at, uh, at uh, UAB in Birmingham was for the uh, Ashto sign code. So for those types of structures, they recommended that the ASTM A6 tolerances be used for field tolerance. Uh, and they, this is based on a, a lot of uh, uh, measurements and uh, as well as uh, uh, discussions with uh, uh, the, the, the uh, fabricators of this type of structure and the erectors. But these do not necessarily apply to heavy structural applications. Okay, let's move on into the design models for buckling. Well, we have uh, a, a lot of different buckling modes that we can talk about. The first one is flexural buckling. And of course, this is what we all think of when we think of column buckling. It's called flexural buckling in the AISC specification. And then of course, everybody is familiar with local buckling or plate buckling. We also have shear buckling, especially if you have a very thin web. And of course, lateral torsional buckling with flexural members and this thing called distortional buckling. So uh, this is not even all of the buckling modes, but um, I will mention that this distortional buckling is not really uh, very uh, it common. You don't have to take, you don't have to account for distortional buckling typically and these these heavy uh, wide flange type shapes, 
I will say this, that there is kind of an interaction, even for lateral torsional buckling, there is some amount of distortional buckling that goes on in there, uh, but it only reduces the strength by a small amount, say one, two percent maybe for most cases. So we just ignore any distortional buckling effects. Uh, but I will say that for some connection elements, you may run into a case where distortional buckling may be important. So uh, just kind of remember that distortional buckling is where you have kind of a, a, a bending of the cross-sectional elements during the buckling. So uh, lateral torsional buckling, all of these other uh, uh, flexural buckling and lateral torsional buckling assume that the cross-section uh, uh, remains the same as it was uh, pre-buckling uh, versus the uh, uh, bending effect on the cross-section. Okay, uh, if you if you run into a case where you're doing uh, light gauge, still you may have to worry about this distortion buckling get a bit more because it affects that more. Now the only other thing that I will mention on this slide is that if you look at the uh, two pictures that are very similar, the one in the bottom left and the one in the middle, uh, the reason they look uh, the same is because they're actually the same member. Actually, I took this. Uh, uh, picture in the middle at uh, Sloss Furnaces, which is a historic landmark here in Birmingham. It used to be a iron making facility and uh, now it's kind of an outdoor museum. And uh, you can see that this flexural buckling of this column, and if you look closely, uh, what I did is I walked around to the uh, left hand side of this flexural buckling picture and took the picture on the bottom left. And you can see that there's uh, the same member has local buckling as well as this flexural buckling on it. So the point is, is that there's this interactive buckling mode, uh, and this has been studied a good bit, especially for these for uh, uh, light gauge steel structures. Uh, and it uh, what it amounts to is that you end up with a load that's smaller than either of these two loads would predict independently uh, when you have both modes occurring at the same time. So just keep that in mind as we as we go along in the presentation. Now what we're going to do with all of these buckling modes is try to identify the primary buckling mode that best fits the buckle shape. And uh, you can base the buckle shape on finite element models or on experimental results. But also, as you'll see once we talk about Whitmore buckling, uh, by Dr. Uh, uh, a method that Dr. Thornton came up with. Uh, you can also do this based on your engineering judgment, which is what we as design engineers have to do a lot. We have to imagine how something is going to buckle and then identify that primary buckling mode and design based on that. OK, so uh, that's the hard part is trying to figure out in our minds the way this a certain connection element will buckle. OK, so once we get past that hard part, we just base the design model on that primary buckling mode, which we have equations already established for the buckling modes for rectangular connection elements, which are going to be flexural buckling for compression members and lateral torsional buckling for flexural members. And what we're going to do once we get those equations is that if we need to, we'll consider the effect of secondary buckling modes, such as, for example, any uh, local buckling or distortional buckling with empirical factors. OK, let's talk about these two modes, the flexural buckling and the lateral torsional buckling mode and kind of see how they were developed. And we'll start off with flexural buckling. I kind of like looking at the uh, the old historical documents on how things were developed. Um, uh, therefore, I pulled this figure directly out of a PhD dissertation at Lehigh University by Dr. Radar Bjorhovda. And uh, this was from 1972. And you can see that there are a lot of different column curves. First of all, on the horizontal axis of this figure, we have the slenderness ratio, or it's actually a slenderness parameter, but it has the slenderness ratio in it. And of course, 
uh, the yield stress and the modulus elasticity are in there too. And on the vertical axis, we have P max over P sub Y, where P max is the buckling load of the column and P Y is what's called in Europe, the squash load of the column. Here we call it the yield load. It's just the area times the yield stress. Okay, so for short columns, we see that that ratio is one and for longer columns, it reduces as we would expect. Now what this is, is the uh, several different column curves which were combined into one to make up the AISC column curve, which are defined by the two equations in the elastic and inelastic zones in chapter E of the AISC specification. Okay, one thing to note on this figure is that the different shapes as well as the different buckling axes get different uh, column curves. Okay, so radar, uh, Dr. Buhabda uh, figured out statistically uh, all of these column curves for each shape and then AISC, of course, decided that it would be way too complicated to have all of these different column curves in their specification. So they came up with a lower bound and uh, combined everything into one. Now, we'll mention that the uh, green boxes represent winners of the Higgins Award in the past. And uh, it was kind of uh, interesting to me how many of these uh, came up in this presentation. Uh, Radar won it in 1987, which by the way, I, I knew Radar for 10 years before I learned how to pronounce his name. Uh, so he, he had to correct me about 50 times over that period before I finally figured it out. Uh, one thing to notice in, this, uh, in the figure is that there are no plate elements. Uh, you have a couple that are welded to the flanges of wide flange shapes, but uh, no independent plate elements are in this figure. So what I did, is I took all of the plate test results that I could find for rectangular plates and plotted the same uh, similar curve where you have the slenderness on the horizontal axis and that load ratio on the vertical axis. And uh, you can see the AISC column curve. The nominal is in the blue solid line and the LRFD available strength curve is on the green dashed line, which means it's just the blue line times 0.9, which is the fee factor. And uh, you can see that uh, it, it actually compares pretty well, probably just as well as say a wide flange shape or a pipe shape uh, buckling uh, uh, over a length of about uh, 10 to 15 feet, uh, like we saw on the last slide. So it compares really well to the AISC column curve. So that answers one of the questions that we had early in the presentation, uh, can we use the AISC chapter E equations for flexural buckling for plate elements? So that question has been answered, but the problem is, is that all of these test results that you see on the screen, the researchers did not measure the out of flatness of the plates before they did the test. So we still have not answered the question about uh, what is the allowable uh, deformation, what is the allowable geometric imperfection in our plate? So uh, you still have to use judgment for that, but we have shown that it does apply to, that the column curve does apply to plate elements. Okay, so we've answered the question for flexural buckling. Now let's look at lateral torsional buckling. It's a little more complicated. And the first research I could find on the use of a lateral torsional buckling design model for connection elements happens to be uh, done by another Higgins Award winner, Professor Joe Ura, who won the award in 1974, but not for this research. This research was 10 years later, um, and it was done, of course, at the University of Texas at Austin, where Professor Ura was uh, a professor, and uh, him and his students came up with this design model for double coat beams that we'll discuss. Now, a double coat beam is a, uh, a, a beam uh, that is gonna frame into another beam at the same elevation, uh, and the other, the supporting member is approximately the same depth, 
therefore you have to cope out both the top and the bottom flanges to get the uh, supported beam uh, into to frame into the supporting member without uh, uh, fouling those flanges. Okay, so a double coat beam, once you take the top and bottom flanges out, you're left with a rectangular portion of the web as shown on the screen. And uh, what Professor Yura and his students came up with is that if you just cut everything off to the right hand side of this cope, so if you if you just uh, throw everything over here away, the rest of that beam, maybe that beam's 20 feet long, but we'll cut it all off, but this anywhere from three to 12 inches roughly uh, for the coped region, then you end up with kind of a short cantilever beam. And what Professor Yura and his students found is that that little short segment can buckle on its own. Uh, in the uh, figure that I have shown on the screen, they found that you have lateral insulation as well as twisting of the cross section. Therefore, they labeled this as a lateral torsional buckling uh, uh, as the primary buckling mode. But before we leave this slide, I want to mention that if you look at the uh, the dash curve over here on the left hand side, you'll see that there is a tiny bit of curvature to that. So what that means is that there is a tiny amount of distortional buckling going on in here. And another thing that I will mention is that as that cope length becomes shorter, the buckling mode kind of changes from this lateral torsional buckling mode that we see on the screen to more of a shear buckling mode. Okay, so we have shear buckling, distortional buckling, and lateral torsional buckling. And uh, everything but the lateral torsional buckling was accounted for in their design model empirically. We'll talk more about this once we get to the to the uh, end of near the end of the presentation where we talk about the wraparound gusset plates. But first we're going to talk about the Whitmore zone. Now before we can discuss the buckling of the Whitmore zone, we need to talk about the stress trajectories. We need to to kind of come up with an effective width of the plate that we can use in our buckling equations. And if we look all the way back at the University of Tennessee research, Whitmore, now you know how the uh, Whitmore section got its name, Whitmore uh, kind of uh, uh, did these experimental results and determined that um, the stress trajectory in these gusset plates is curved. However, for a simplified design model, he said, well, why don't we just use 30 degrees? And that pretty well describes how the stress flows through the gusset plate. So Whitmore proposed, based on his experimental results on gusset plates, a 30 degree stress trajectory. Now, I will mention that these were done on quarter scale models. They, they were strain gauged. There were wires going everywhere on these. You could barely see the gusset plates in some cases, there were so many strain gauges on them, uh, but there were quarter scale models on one eighth inch thick aluminum gusset plates. And if you take a look up here, if you look really closely, this is actually directly from this research. I like to, like I said, I like to use the figures directly from the research. That's 7.43 kips, that's 6.53 kips. So there were very small loads. They were all in the elastic range because that's how they did research back then. They didn't really test too many things to destruction. They just wanted to know what the stresses were. OK, so keep that in mind as we as we progress uh, for over the next couple of slides. Um, I will mention that uh, that I have used that Whitmore. Uh, that 30 degree Whitmore section on gusset plates that are several inches thick on long span trusses with thousands of kips going through the diagonal members, uh, double plane gusset plates several inches thick. And of course, it, it's kind of scary to think about that it was uh, that it was developed on one eighth inch thick 
aluminum gusset plates with seven or eight kits max going through there. So, uh, but but let's see how it kind of it's, everything has progressed since that uh, uh, 1950s research at Tennessee. Uh, one thing I will mention uh, is that uh, uh, the, the reason I, I kind of included this part in the presentation is to kind of show you that uh, uh, sometimes your ideas come from places that you do not expect. Uh, I, as you could probably tell, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, uh, stability of structures is kind of my hobby. And I was kind of going through this big thick book that I've got shown on the screen. And uh, I'd kind of read all of the interesting stuff, at least what I thought was interesting from it. And I got toward the end and they started talking about stability as a fracture problem. And of course, that's pretty common if you look in the uh, books on fracture mechanics and uh, fatigue, uh, the crack growth problem and, and when it becomes unstable. But uh, you, you, I didn't really expect a, a book on buckling that I thought was going to be all on buckling to be discussing stability as a fracture problem. So I uh, kind of got my interest to see where they were going. And they had about a half a page devoted to this derivation that I've have shown on the screen where they calculated theoretically, and this is the only place I know of that the stress trajectory uh, was calculated theoretically. All of the other research has been experimental or with finite element modeling. So what they found is that the stress around a crack flows at a certain angle, and they solved using a fracture mechanics approach for that angle and found that it was 32.5 degrees in their little half page derivation. So I kind of uh, uh, thought that was pretty interesting that it matched up pretty well with all of the previous research, including the Whitmore research. And about 10 years later, I kind of expanded on that, that idea and carried it into the inelastic fracture mechanics range and uh, found out that that trajectory angle theta increases with the inelastic deformation capacity. So what this means is that for very slender gusset plates, you can use that 30 or 32.5 degrees for your stress trajectory angle. But once you get into more common gusset plates that have a lot of inelastic potential uh, before buckling, you can use a wider stress trajectory angle. OK, so the stretch that, that theta ranges anywhere from that around 30 or 32.5 for the elastic range all the way up to 45 degrees for uh, very uh, 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 thick and non slender gusset plates. So that's a, a huge increase in load on your uh, Whitmore section. As we have it now, the AISC manual uses the Whitmore recommendation of 30 degrees. So the way you calculate an effective width using that 30 degree stress trajectory is you go from the first bolt to the last bolt in a connection and spread the load out at 30 degrees and add anything in the middle if you have two rows of bolts like shown in the figure and call that your Whitmore width. You do a similar thing for welded connections as shown in the right hand figure and multiply by your gusset plate thickness to get the Whitmore section, which is nothing more than equivalent uh, rectangular axially loaded member. So at this point, you can kind of throw away everything on the outside of that Whitmore width and treat this as a rectangular bar. If you're in tension, uh, you just go into the specification and design as a tension member. If you're a compression, it gets a little more complicated. So let's talk about the stability in that Whitmore section. Okay, uh, Dr. Thornton, Dr. Uh, Bill Thornton won the award in 1995, and oddly enough, not for this research that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, it's kind of interesting to see how many uh, uh, won the award, but not for gusset plates. 
uh, for something else. But uh, uh, this is one of my favorite journal papers of all time. The one that's listed at the bottom, 1984, Bracing Connections for Heavy Construction. And the reason is that uh, Dr. Thornton came up with this design method for compression in the Whitmore section before there were any buckling tests in the in, on gusset plates like this. So he used his engineering judgment and knowledge of how these gusset plates behaved and came up with this design model and published it in this paper. So what we have is uh, uh, what's called the, the equivalent column method. And essentially it just breaks everything down into that Whitmore section, which is that equivalent rectangular column. And then you go into AFC spe spe specification section E3 and uh, design as a design for flexural buckling of that column. Okay, there are quite a few things that can cause inaccuracies with that model. Uh, the first one uh, is the buckle shape doesn't really match what you would get with flexural buckling of a column. As shown by Dr. White at Georgia Tech, who won the award in 2009, not for this research. This research was done a few years later. Uh, as you can see from the buckle shape on this double plane gusset plate connection, that it looks nothing like a straight line hinge point. It's kind of a curved L shape, uh, kind of a strange buckle shape in there that we really can't predict with anything other than an equation that's going to take three hours to uh, figure out. So um, uh, we need to figure out some way to simplify uh, this, this buckle shape where we can use it with that equivalent column method. Okay, there are a few other things that we need to talk about that affect the stability in the Whitmore zone. And the reason I'm going through all these is not so much just to, to show you uh, the factors affecting the stability, but to show you the thought process behind uh, what happened uh, uh, when, when uh, the effective length factors were selected. Okay, so uh, all of these things listed, like the Poisson effect is selected because it's a plate element rather than a column, and some things like that. We've already talked about those bottom two bullet points. Uh, a couple of other things. Uh, the out-of-plane restraint provided by the non-shaded portions. In other words, that shaded portion shown on the screen is the, uh, the equivalent column. And anything outside that is going to tend to restrain that equivalent column. So we have an account. Another thing, the stress tends to uh, keep um, uh, trajecting uh, beyond the Whitmore section as shown in the figure. So essentially what we're going to do is uh, we'll have a, a, the Whitmore load uh, that we've uh, that we're going to use for calculations at the top of this equivalent column, and we'll have a smaller load due to that load shedding effect and to other portions of the gusset plate at the bottom of this equivalent column. So you can see that a lot of the things we've listed can be beneficial to the buckling strength of the Whitmore section, and a lot of them are detrimental. So uh, let's kind of see how they offset each other. And uh, the way we'll do that is with the effective length. So what we know now is that uh, the effective length defined by L sub C in the latest edition of the AISC specification, uh, L sub C is equal to K times L. So now all of a sudden, we need to know two things instead of one. Instead of the effective length, we need to know the unbraced length and the effective length factor. So what we're going to do is approach this as uh, we're going to define the unbraced length uh, kind of by taking a look at the buckle shape, define the unbraced length based on the buckle shape, and then kind of use the effective length factor, for lack of a better term, as a uh, fudge factor. Uh, well, if you want to be, if you're a professor, you would probably call that an empirical factor. As a design engineer, I call it a fudge factor. 
Okay, so if you look in the literature, there are two different ways to define the unbraced length. The easy way is on the left hand side where L is equal to L1, which is the length from the Whitmore section to the adjacent framing members along the center of the diagonal member. The uh, slightly more complicated way to do that is with the average of L1, L2, and L3, where L2 and L3 are at the edge of the Whitmore sections. Okay, so we know that we have two different ways that we can define the length, the buckling length. So now we need to take a look at the effective length factors. And of course, everybody is familiar with the figure on the screen where we go in and select an effective length factor of 1.0 if we have pin pin conditions or 0.65 if we have fixed fixed con conditions. Uh, the reason I showed you all of those inaccuracies in the uh, Whitmore zone buckling is so that you'll know that you can't just go in and base everything on the buckle shape. We need to have some empirical factors in here. And uh, like I mentioned, we're going to do that by using the effective length factor K. So we can't pull it directly out of the table like we would like to for the Whitmore section. In fact, the effective length factor is going to be dependent on a lot of things, uh, such as which of those two definitions of L we choose. We need to we need to use different effective length factors uh, depending on that. Uh, it's dependent on the gusset plate geometry. In this presentation, we'll talk about only corner gusset plates. If you want other gusset plate geometries, take a look at Design Guide 29 from AISC. Also, I will mention that uh, the last two bullet points here kind of uh, talk about that we have to calibrate the effective length factor based on the column curve as well as the phi factor that we're going to use, which the phi factor is dependent on a couple of different things uh, which are different uh, from uh, AISC and AASHTO. OK, so the point is that K, L, and phi all need to be selected uh, from the same source. In other words, you can't just pull the effective length uh, from one journal article and then pull L from the ASC manual and then pull fee from, say, the uh, uh, AASHTO specification. OK, so uh, you have to get all of those from the same source, uh, K, L, and fee. That's the important thing about that last slide. Now let's take a look at um, the statistics on this. I don't want to bore you with all these, these uh, beta factors or, or anything like that, but uh, this kind of just gives us an indicator of how, how accurate the method is. And our target beta is uh, for these is going to be right around four. That's kind of really what we need to know. And anything less than that is probably fine uh, because this kind of these typically yield in kind of a ductile manner, at least for these compact gusset plates. So let's take a look at the top line of this, this uh, analysis where the original research by Thornton, actually it was not research, it was just a, a thought or, or uh, that design method, the equivalent column method where Thornton proposed using L average, an effective link factor of 0.65. And back then the equivalent fee factor was about 0.85, that's for ASD. But uh, the equivalent was about 0.85. And, and uh, miraculously, even before all of this statistical information was available to us, we had no tests on compression gusset plates, no finite element modeling on compression gusset plates. And uh, it's just amazing that using his engineering judgment, Thornton came up with a method that's this accurate to get a beta equals 3.6. So, so that's kind of a good lesson for us that we can come up with good methods to design without having to go through the trouble of doing tests and finite element models if we use our engineering judgment. Coming all the way down to the bottom, this has not been published yet, but I did a statistical analysis and found that using L1 is slightly more accurate, plus it's easier to use than using L average. 
So I used L1 with a K factor. It just so happens to be 0.5. Um, and uh, using the fee factor in the AISC specification, this is, by the way, for AISC because it's got a life to dead ratio of three, uh, which ASHTO is going to be different. Uh, you end up with right on the target reliability of four. So that's kind of uh, what I'm going to propose in the next journal article uh, is uh, the values on that bottom row to use with corner gusset plates. Now, if you want other shapes, like I mentioned, Take a look at Design Guide 29, and you will see a lot of different gusset plate types in there and different K factors and links to use with a fee factor of 0.9. The uh, Design Guide was written by Dr. Thornton as well as Larry Muir, who won the award in 2014. OK, that does it for the uh, Whitmore section. And now let's move on to the final topic of the presentation, which will cover wraparound gusset plates. And as we mentioned early in the presentation, the wraparound gusset plates are typically used for horizontal bracing members. Therefore, you have this wide, uh, well, it can be a wide plan shape, but uh, you have this WT shape in this case, uh, brace member in the horizontal plane of a structure. And looking at the plan view, you have the gusset plate framing into two beams that meet at a column. And you can see that you have the giant cutout right in that area of high stress in the Whitmore section. So really, you can't calculate the buckling strength of the Whitmore section using air. Um, so we have to come up with another way to design these gusset plates. And the way we do that, not surprisingly, is that we're going to break this down into two different parts. And in this case, we call these these edge interfaces legs. And we're going to we're going to model each leg independently of one another as a rectangular beam. And what we're going to do ever, ever since I got into the business as a detailer, even uh, the way we did this. Uh, I didn't question at the time, but I've kind of verified that this is accurate. Now, as we put this component, I'll call it the vertical component, even though these both are in the horizontal plane, this vertical component will go over here to leg one. And uh, this, uh, I'll call it the horizontal component, piece of R2, will go down here. So that makes it very easy to calculate. And this is accurate uh, for reasons that I won't get into, such as uh, stiffness and design assumptions. Um, so all we're doing is uh, uh, taking these components from the brace member and adding those two components to each of the two legs. Therefore, what we have is uh, legs that are subjected only to shear and flexure. We're going to have a linearly varying moment diagram with the maximum moment at the reentrant corner, which is right here. So for leg one, you have your maximum moment along that plane, and for leg two, you have your maximum moment along that plane. The maximum moments are simply the uh, uh, component of the brace load for leg one, P sub R1, times the cutout length, E2. OK, so that's a pretty easy calculation for each of these two legs. And not surprisingly, we found that once we separate these legs and look at the buckle shape of the isolated legs, we found similar buckle shapes to what was found in the University of Texas double coat beam research, which is uh, lateral translation and twisting. So we call this primary buckling mode lateral torsional buckling. With uh, for lateral torsional buckling of rectangular members, we can go into spec section F11 which was added fairly recently to the AISC specification specifically for the flexural strength of rectangular members. And it includes the uh, lateral torsional buckling of these members in the inelastic and elastic zones. Now, I will mention that uh, this actually was done uh, years and years ago for my PhD research, this, these uh, tests on finite element models. And uh, 
I can remember in my, in my defense, I thought that I was going to be stuck there another year or something because the professors were telling me that that uh, this was simply one big plate buckling problem. And uh, by then I was kind of uh, had, you know, had had uh, designed a lot of these wraparound gusset plates uh, myself and uh, also detailed a lot of these gusset plates. And so I kind of knew we needed a, a, a simpler design model. So I, my argument was, is that we need something that can be done in less than three pages. So if you go in and, just, and try to calculate a theoretical plate buckling model for the shape shown on the screen, it's going to be three pages long. And then one small change in any variable will uh, change the equation. So you can't just have a book of equations and give that to a design engineer and say, OK, you know, select which one you need and uh, spend three hours getting in an Excel program. Uh, what we need is a simplified design model. And the way we do that is we change that one very complicated plate buckling problem into two simple lateral torsional buckling models. And uh, they bought it. Uh, apparently they bought it and uh, let me pass. Uh, otherwise, I still may be there. So the problem comes in. It's the same as what we had for the Whitmore section. Uh, for the Whitmore section, we we're talking about Fletcher buckling. So we needed the buckling length and the effective length factor. For lateral torsional buckling, we need C sub B and LB to go into spec section F11. And finally, this is the uh, uh, final design method that we uh, came on. And the way, the way we derive these values for LB and C sub B is uh, the same way we did for the Whitmore section. We looked at the buckle shape and saw that LB was approximately the distance from the uh, center of the beam over to the center of the adjacent leg. In other words, L sub B1 is equal to cutout dimension E2 plus half the depth of uh, leg D2. OK, so that's how we found L sub B. And then knowing that we could had this fudge factor or this empirical factor C sub B uh, that we could use similar to the way we use K for the Whitmore buckling. And uh, as it turns out, though, uh, apparently we selected pretty good with LB so that C sub B equals 1.0 gave us accurate answers. So this is the final design method for wraparound gusset plates that we. And with that. The uh, 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 conclusions are that connections are separated into zones designed independently where each connection element is modeled with a member with predictable behavior, such as a tension member, compression member, or beam. Luckily for us, the design models for rectangular connection elements can be based on two primary buckling modes, which are flexural buckling and lateral torsional buckling. And with that, I believe I'm going to turn it back over to, I'm not sure if Steve or Bo is going to take it, but I'll turn it back over to you for questions. So is anyone, there. okay, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, if anyone has any questions, just uh, if you have your mic um, available, just uh, raise your hand and, and uh, we'll unmute you. Okay, go ahead, Victor. Uh, hi, a simple question. Uh, now that we're going to higher grade skills, uh, uh, is much of this uh, research has to be repeated or uh, given the difference in, in steel grades, or can we still use some of the guidelines provided uh, with steel, which was probably grade 60 or 36, you know, all these uh, experimental knowledge we have gained over, you know, how can we use it now with the, the different great steels? Okay. I'm, so, I'm sorry, dude. Was, was there something else? 
No, no, that, that's it. Huh? Okay, okay. The uh, the answer is is that uh, that I don't know. Um, I will say this: the wraparound gusset plates, uh, they were done with dual cert steel, so they were specified A36, but we got grade 50, uh, so those were over 50, but they do not get up to um, up to the 65, and the and the uh, a, a lot of the uh, early research in the 80s for the Whitmore buckling was done on 36, which was actually probably 30. 37, 38, 40, and then the later research was done mostly on 50. And there were, there has been some that was done on uh, the higher strength steel that compared well. Now, this is for the Whitmore section buckling uh, mm -hmm. that compared well with the higher strength steel, but uh, um, I'd have to look back to, to the, the, it is included in that database for mm -hmm. that, for those, for the higher strength steels that were tested. Uh, so, but a, a lot of this research is still going on, even for the main members, uh, for using the high strength steel. Mm -hmm. And the main differences uh, are the residual stresses, and uh, I think they're also looking at the out of straightness of the columns and some things like that. So there's no reason, in my opinion, that all of these equations that I've showed you cannot be used for the higher strength steels mm -hmm. because uh, uh, the the the, uh, I don't believe that the residual stresses, this is my personal opinion, that uh, the residual stresses and the out of flatness of the plates uh, would be any more for for those. But there there is a thing that we need to think about. Like if you weld, for example, if you get welding distortion on these plates, uh, is, is that going to be more for higher strength still? Or if you get galvanizing distortion or something like that. So those are the things to think about. Um, overall, I will admit that the answer is that I, I do not know, but I would not hesitate to use these for 65 KSI material. Uh, when you get too much above that, I would just, I mean, we really don't have much of a choice. You know, there's uh, too much above that, and, and I would have to kind of think about it, you know, go through the go through the same process that I did in this presentation and think about what all is different with those higher strength steels. But uh, I don't really see that we we're going to have much of a choice if we ran across that situation now. We just have to use our judgment. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other questions? Okay. Well, oh, Victor, you raised your hand again. Yes. No, no. It just occurred to me um, how how much uh, uh, cyclic loading uh, could change the behavior of these. Uh, wrap around uh, gusset plates, like when you're applying the load uh, under, uh, say, dynamic loading, uh, does the capacity goes down a little bit, or what's the your your opinion? How much could okay. it change? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good question, and the answer, again, I'll have to say, I don't know, I, I, th I think you're asking, both of these are really good questions. And we do not have research into that. Um, mm -hmm. My opinion is that, um, if, if the, and of course, if we're using these in seismic type systems, it depends on, you know, if we're going to, hopefully we're not going to try to use these wraparound gusset plates as ductile elements, mm -hmm. um, where we're going to have uh, extensive yielding in these legs. But if we design these with the, uh, uh, and like I say, I'm not a seismic expert, but I believe it's called the overstrength factor. If we if we apply the overstrength factor and design these um, as as a shear diaphragm type element, um, I believe we can keep the forces low enough where we won't get extensive yielding in those plates. But if we do get extensive yielding in the plates, uh, or even uh, even if it's in tension, 
my my test results found that um, even in, even when the gusset plate is in tension, that you you can have the buckling of those legs. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, I think that you would have first of all it would rearrange your your residual stress pattern. Mm -hmm. And uh, this other thing that it would do is that it would kind of cause, uh, I guess we could think of it as an initial geometric imperfection, which in this case would be defined by the twist and some out of plane deformation. Mm -hmm. uh, so we would have that in there that would lower the strength. I don't know what, I, I would have to think about the residual stress effect, mm -hmm. but I know that this would lower the strength uh, mm -hmm. to have initial geometric imperfections caused by a buckling that occurred previously in the structure. So we want to avoid that if we can. Mm -hmm. um, any, 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 uh, uh, and, and this is uh, kind of what you would get with a stocky column. These gusset plates, we tested, I believe, 15 of these. And especially in tension, you get a gradual, a gradual movement out of plane uh, rather than I think one of the gusset plates out of those 15, the very slender one, was uh, uh, buckled instantaneously, like we think of as kind of a, 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 a bifurcation type buckling. And the rest of them just kind of buckled inelastically and slowly moved out of plane. So you might end up with something that looks like that specimen 7C on the bottom picture there. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you apply more load in a, in a later earthquake, and then the strength is not going to be as much as what you uh, thought was there originally. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, Dr. Wong. Go ahead and uh, unmute yourself. Hello, uh, Paul. This is Jamin. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for giving a presentation uh, to uh, us in San Diego. Yeah, regarding the last uh, question on the cyclic loading, because we are in San in California, so we are all engineers here, always concerned about the uh, effect of seismic loading. Yeah, just like you said, there's uh, very little study and the research on this, but uh, I assume that. Uh, that the 90 degree corner, the, the detail is very important. The first thing that came to my mind is if there's a cyclic loading or if that corner is in tension, as you show, as you showed in the top figure. If that's the case, then that the radius that the workmanship, I believe is very, very important to minimize stress concentration and the potential for fracture. Yes, and um, yeah, yeah. Hey, Charming, I, I appreciate your comment on that. And uh, going back to the uh, drawing of that, let's say that we had a, a compression load in this brace. Therefore, you would have tension, tension. And, and if we simply use these simplified models, like we said, we're going to have maximum stresses uh, along this plane. And if you look at that original journal paper on this, on this, uh, some flexural stresses here uh, from each leg. Therefore, you're going to have a two-dimensional stresses that are really high in this area. Uh, so you're going to have pulling uh, and tension in uh, that area in both directions. And um, of course, in our test. They were just monotonic tests, but I, I believe just looking from the test results on, on coke beams and, and similar situations like beam web openings, that of course the crack was going to grow from, from that area if we have uh, high cyclic loading. Um, the best I could tell from my test, that was extremely ductile, even though we had the, the biaxial stresses for uh, for a low cycle type of loading, you would get in a seismic event. But um, uh, I will say this, that uh, we, as detailers, we, we always just draw a sharp corner there. 
Uh, back when we were drawing with pencil, we would just draw without this radius. It would just look something like that. You know, uh, it, you know, we wouldn't even take the time to draw the radius and, and the fabricators would do whatever they wanted there. And what I've found in all of these specimens, as well as other specimens I've had fabricated and other fabricators, is uh, that that radius is about one inch. Uh, or actually, they, they've all used one, a one inch radius uh, for, for all the conditions that, uh, that I've seen. So, um, and that's been really good workmanship at that corner, even though we didn't really specify. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions? All right, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Dowswell for his uh, great presentation today. And thank you all for attending. Um, let's give uh, Dr. Dowswell a uh, round of applause. Yeah. Virtual, then, please. Um, I would like to invite everybody um, to our uh, um, next presentation on December 15th, where we go over the SoFi Stadium. Um, and I also would like to invite all of you to register for the uh, SEAC convention from uh, um, December 2nd through the 4th in its virtual format. So please look on, uh, um, on SEAC's website uh, to register for that. And with that, uh, we'll uh, conclude the presentation today. Thank you all very much.